Good morning, David Chapel. It's another day's journey, and I'm glad about it. Amen. Another day's journey. I um, want to thank Pastor Parker for the opportunity to stand in his absence. Um, as I always say, I take this seriously. I don't take it for granted, and I recognize uh, the blessed privilege it is to be here. You know, it's true. You know, Pastor says this all the time when he deals with his children and his family. More is caught than taught. And so I want to thank him for being a model so that I could catch some of the things he's trying to instill in me and in us. Amen. I believe there is a word from the Lord. Thank you, brother, for reading uh, the scripture. And I would encourage you to read Numbers 12 in your, your leisure time. How y'all doing? Sorry, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Um, I've been wrestling with this, you know, as I come to the Word of God uh, and I prepare myself. I, I always find that I have to preach to myself um, as I preach to you. And so as I wrestled with this text, I came up with a question, or it hit me as a question, and that question is, do you have a hater problem? Do you have a hater problem? You know, people that just can't stand to see you doing anything positive. People that have no problem letting you lead so they can complain from the back. Anybody have haters? If so, I want to tell you to be of good courage because the text today is for you. Now, I'm assuming that everyone in here is in the category of having to deal with haters in their lives. If, however, you have no haters trying to get at you, I have two suggestions. One, keep living because they just might be getting ready to go at you. Suggestion two, have you considered that you just might be a hater? So I came across a little quiz to help you identify whether you're a hater or not. And it, it, it goes like this. Are you overly judgmental towards others? Do you have a problem giving people their flowers when they succeed? Do you like to count other people's money? What's she doing with that doggone $20 lipstick? She don't need that $20 lipstick. What are you doing with that brand new car? How do you afford that car? What are you doing with that? I don't know why I had to explain that one, but it sounds like y'all got the gist of it. <laughs> Do you smile in people's faces, but all the time you want to take their place? I'm just trying to qualify the room. I'm just trying to qualify the room, and having done so, in all seriousness, I think it's safe to say that as we go through life pushing towards the purpose God has for our lives, we all find that there are places where we come face to face or face to back with haters. OJs call them backstabbers. But for our discussion today, hater is fine. Those who are trying to hate on us use the text, as I mentioned, to get our attention and cross us up as we try to move forward doing what God has called us to do. They attack and they betray us, usually when we least expect it. You see, betrayal is one of the more common forms of adversity experienced in today's culture. In our lifetime, we will have either been betrayed or will betray someone else. Nations have gone to war because of it. Companies have been formed and ended because of it. Societies have been built and torn down by it. People have been damaged and have done damage to others because of it. Yeah. Historically, betrayal is everywhere. 
It's also a common occurrence in biblical history. Uh, from the beginning, we see betrayal in the Bible. Adam betrays God, Cain and Abel, Saul and David, David and Bathsheba's husband, Uriah, Joseph and his brothers. Even Jesus was betrayed. If you have been betrayed by a hater, you are in good company. Betrayal is a large part of the adversity we will face in our lifetime. Why is this the case? I, I believe it's because throughout history we have just been a selfish and lustful people. We desire or cover what others have and what others can do with their God-given gifts. We're also insecure in ourselves. We look at our own lives, forget the blessings that God has placed on us. We get spiritual amnesia when it comes to our gifts and talents because we foolishly try to measure them against what others are doing. Our eyes are not on our own purpose, and because of this, it becomes easy to miss our place in the overall big picture. As a result, we're hurting each other, being disobedient, hindering God's progress by tearing each other down. Too busy looking across the street, or across the cubicle, or even across the pew. Hello, somebody trying to worry about other folks' stuff and failing to acknowledge that God is doing great things in our lives as well. Amen. Yeah, we become like the followers of Moses in the text. We're wandering around aimlessly when we should be moving towards our purpose. When we desire what others have or what they can do, betrayal is not too far down the road. If we're betrayed, it can cause us to react in ungodly ways. We decide to pay back the betrayer or act in the same way they acted towards us. We forget that just like those who betray us, we are sinners who have come short of the glory of God. It is at this moment of betrayal, however, that we put our holier-than-thou clothes on and act like we ain't never done nothing to nobody. Then get angry and self-righteous to those who wrong us. We spend too much time trying to get back at those who do us wrong, and we want them to feel and suffer like we do. And so we also allow betrayal to stop us in our tracks. Perhaps we were moving forward, um, but our anger and our pain at the betrayal becomes our focus. You know, betrayal is an, even, an evil act caused by Satan to throw us off course. Why are we so surprised when betrayal comes at us? I believe that rather than being surprised that betrayal occurs, we should be prepared for it. Amen. Amen. Being prepared to deal with and avoid betrayal is important if we're going to complete the task that God has for each of us. So just like Moses, we find that betrayal usually happens when we least expect it. It occurs when we don't need it to happen. And we also see that sometimes our own family members are the culprits. Yeah. Miriam and Aaron were speaking against Moses and made it seem like it was because of his wife. Yeah. Their conversation, however, leads us to understand their true motives. Yeah. They were jealous of Moses yeah. and his authority. They knew what God had already done through them but they seem to have forgotten. And as a result of their coveting Moses' gifts, their judgment is impaired. And it isn't as though these two were evil people. No, no, on the contrary. These were wonderful God-fearing people, and their role was vital to the success of Moses' uh, mission. They were the last people you would think would betray anyone, much less their own brother. Good people sometimes do bad things. But why did they hate on their own brother? Yeah. Maybe they weren't happy with the way Moses was handling things. Uh, they say, has God only spoken through Moses? Didn't he speak through us also? Yeah. Maybe he thought, they thought Moses should have asked them to take on more responsibilities. What we do know is they were worried about Moses when they should have been looking at themselves. Yeah. How then should we handle betrayal or haters when they enter our lives? You know, there's self-help books and posts that seek to help us understand things from the haters' point of view. But as we all know, haters gon' hate. So fortunately, I believe the Word of God gives us a great example in our text today. Moses exhibits 
several qualities that can help us as we deal with haters and betrayal while continuing to move towards our purpose. Three qualities. Quality one, he remained focused. See, Moses didn't allow what Aaron and Miriam were trying to do to keep him from doing what God wanted him to do. And we shouldn't either. Unfortunately, too much, too many of us use betrayal as an excuse, keeping us from our promised land. We do this every time we allow somebody to speak negatively in our spirit. Every time we buy into a negative statement or become paralyzed by someone's actions toward us, we become discouraged to the point that we're tempted to move further away from the path God has us on. What we need to do is remain focused, keeping our eyes on our purpose. So what happens when we lose focus? We forget what we're supposed to be doing. We, su- we forget what God has called us to do. Yeah. We forget that we all have a purpose in this kingdom. Yeah. Yeah. Now, the Temptations are one of my favorite groups. Um, I, I like their songs. I like the movement. I like what they do. I like the writing. Motown in general is a wonderful thing. Yeah. One of the writers, uh, Roger Penzabine, uh, wrote one of their songs. Uh, from their album, The Temptations Which Wish It Wouldn't Rain. The song was called, I Wish It Wouldn't Rain. You see, Roger had something he had to deal with. He wrote that song because he found out his wife was cheating on him. And so all of that real life pain and suffering made its way into the song. But he couldn't get over it couldn't bring himself to leave her, and his emotions on the situation, you can tell they're present throughout the song. On New Year's Eve 1967, a week after the release of I Wish It Wouldn't Rain, Roger Penzabine committed suicide. After his death, I Wish It Would Rain peaked at number four on the Billboard Hot 100 and reached the number one position on the Billboard R&B singles chart for a three-week run. The single was the focal point of that album, but he didn't see it. He missed it because he couldn't overcome the betrayal in his life, remaining focused on his purpose. What could he have done? That's just one song. What could he have done if he had just remained focused? You see, the quality of remaining focused means we don't allow betrayal to keep us from our purpose. Don't let that person at work who took credit for our work keep us from doing our best. Don't let that friend who we thought would be our future spouse keep us from finding that Mr. or Mrs. Wright. Don't let that person who always puts us down and tells us that we'll amount to nothing keep us from overcoming that negativity and forging our own reality. Keep focused on what God has for us and leave the haters behind. Leave the crabs in the bucket. You got to stay focused. You got to stay focused and remember your purpose. Quality two, Moses to play with this play. Quality two. He remained faithful. You see, we need to press on despite what someone says or does to us. When someone has spoken against us, we shouldn't let that betrayal stop us dead in our tracks. We see in the text that Moses remained faithful to what God wanted him to do, despite what others were trying to do to him. He surrendered his will for God's will. So when this betrayal occurred in his life, he was still able to move forward. If Moses had allowed this situation to stop him, it would have kept Israel from entering the promised land. However, we see in the text that God reminded them that Moses was faithful in all my house. What a powerful affirmation. Moses didn't solicit a powerful statement like that. He didn't have to ask God to act on his behalf. He didn't have to say a word. All he had to do was remain faithful. We can't be shirking our responsibilities and falling short of what we're supposed to do, worried about what they're saying to us over here and what they're saying to us over there and what they're doing to us back here. We've got to remain faithful to what God has called us to do. 
We've been equipped to be faithful through our life, through our experiences. See, some of y'all missing out on Sunday school. I'm going to be real with you. We, 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 we spoke about uh, temptation, the source of temptation. Temptation versus testing. Now, let's be real for a second. Do you think the Moses that killed the Egyptian for beating up a Hebrew would have handled this well? Think about it. Think about it. He had to go through some things. He had to deal with some things. Forty years in the desert prepared him for 40 years in the wilderness. We see God prepares us for all of these things. Everything we're going to face through our testing, through uh, our growth. You need to be careful when you ask God to give you something. Oh, Lord, give me patience. <laughs> oh, he's going to give it to you. Show sure enough going to give it to you, but you're going to have to go through some things to understand what it means to have patience. Faithfulness. Lord, give me faithfulness. Grant me faithfulness. And you read about faithfulness in a book. Yeah, you might read about it, but God's going to show you what it means to be faithful. And then he's going to show you what it means to stay faithful, despite what people are doing to you. Stay faithful. Remain focused. Remain faithful. Remain forgiving. Uh-oh, uh-oh. Yeah, that's a hard one right there. Forgiving. So we notice in Numbers 12, 10 through 13, that Moses makes the healing choice of forgiveness rather than unforgiveness. By asking God to heal Miriam, he is calling to the one who forgives all sin and heals all disease. His cry to God is the strongest indication of Moses' desire to forgive. Moses had to forgive Aaron and Miriam because to not do so would have hindered further the journey they were on. By forgiving them, it allowed all three to be healed physically and spiritually. Forgiveness also allowed the relationship to be healed. You know, in reading the book, Why Forgive by Johann Christoph Arnold, one of the more memorable quotes is, there is a hard law. When an injury is done to us, we never recover until we forgive. See, sometimes forgiveness isn't for the people that have wronged you. Forgiveness is for you. So you can move forward in your purpose. So you can remain focused on what God called you to do. So you can remain faithful to the task God has called you to do. You've got to forgive. You've got to forgive. By harboring and even embracing ill will that comes with retribution... That's the other side of forgiveness. We cannot be used by God to further his kingdom. An unforgiving spirit is by its very nature a hindrance from helping us focus on God's will. And instead leads us to focus on how bad we can make it for someone else. Forgiveness is a choice we all need to make when given the opportunity to do so. By making the choice to forgive, Moses gave Miriam the opportunity to be cleansed as well as a way to work her way back into the family. Yeah. Now, we may not want to move forward with those who wrong us, but forgiveness creates an environment that allows for the possibility. Yeah. It's a gift that is given far less than it should be, the type of gift that is sought by so many but given by so few. Moses had the opportunity to give it, and he did so without delay. Focus, faithfulness, forgiveness. So you see, by having the qualities of focus, faithfulness, and forgiveness, we can build up our resistance and response to betrayal. I want you all to notice something. I, I didn't spend a whole lot of time talking about what Miriam and Aaron did. I didn't spend no time on them. We shouldn't focus on the haters. We should be like Moses and stay focused, faithful, and forgiving. 
Stay focused on what God has for us. Remain faithful even when others are trying to damage us. Be forgiving because if we're honest with ourselves, we know we too have fallen short of the glory of God, our Father. When we stay focused, faithful, and forgiving, we decrease the effect of what our haters are trying to do and increase our trust in the Father. Why should we take on a fight that's not ours anyway? We sing those songs, the battle's not yours, it's the Lord. What? What? Are you sure about that? I mean, if you're going to sing that song, be about it. Be about it. I don't know. It's just, there's some things that I overheard of when it deals with battles and what we're facing, what we have to overcome. You know, I've over, overheard kids in life talking about, you know, my daddy's going to get you. My daddy can get your daddy. I used to say that too. I'm going to get my daddy on you. See, the phrase seems to indicate that if times get rough and we need someone to fight for us, all we need to do is call our daddy. Daddy will come and handle the problem. Well, I'm so glad today that our father is there when we need him. Glad that he's watching over us and ready, willing, and able to fight our battles. Because of our Father God, we have confidence that if we do what we're supposed to do, if we don't let the backstabbers and backbiters and haters take us off our game, we have a God that will stick closer than a brother. He'll move people and obstacles out of the way. He'll protect us from all hurt, harm, or danger. Our Father is the big dog on the block. Can't nobody beat our dad. He stands high. He looks low. He's a comforter when we need comforting, a doctor when we need healing, a present help in a time of trouble. Our Father is all that and so much more. He fights our battles. He stands with us and no one else will. He keeps his eyes on us, blesses us, forgives us when we do wrong, holds us up when others wrong us. He isn't fake or phony. We can tell him anything and he'll keep it to himself. He's the same way yesterday, today, tomorrow. And if we exhibit the qualities of focus, faithfulness, and forgiveness, we too will receive from our Father the same affirmation that Moses did. We too will hear that we are faithful in all of God's house because our faithfulness will be blessed.